Hello guys, welcome back to the channel. This is part six now of the um, of the Dasworks 170 second scale U-boat, World War One U-boat U9. And this is the conning tower. And as you can see now, I've gone round with some Mr. Surfacer and I've done all the, um, the seams and everything. And we're gonna give them a sand back and see how they look. Now, yes, Mr. Surfacer is white. This one is called Mr. Base White 1000. So it's the same as Mr. Surfacer, but it's white. And I've used this because basically that in there where I could go and fill in that area in there. Inside, let me show you. I thought I'll use Mr. White Mr. Surfacer and that'll save me painting it white afterwards. I mean, it doesn't need to be perfect because you can hardly see it, but I think a, a gray piece of plastic would stand out like a sore thumb. So, um, yeah, so I'm kind of hoping that by the time this goes out, I'll have had some responses about these holes in here. If you remember, I talked in part five about these D-shaped holes in the actual conning tower, but they've only got like a one millimeter round hole inside them. And I don't think that's correct. I, I think there should be something in there. It should be opened or I don't know. It just doesn't look right to me to have it like that. I mean, maybe they, because of these D-shaped holes here, maybe they should be opened up. I, I just don't know. Um, it almost looks like something goes in there, doesn't it? But it doesn't. So I don't know. There's nothing in the kit that goes in there. Maybe it's there's something missing or whatever. So uh, let's get on and um, get this rubbed down. And uh, I'm just going to rub down the deck area first. Okay, and then, whoops, it easy. Throwing it around the place. And then we can, um, oh, there's a raised area on there. So you have to be careful not to get rid of that. But I want to make sure that we've got the um, the decks nice and level and that we haven't got any surprises around the corner. Um, this back end here I'm going to sand. And I'm not sure if that's supposed to be sanded to a point or, or what, but I'm certainly going to sand it so that all the Mr. Servicer disappears. And then we'll have a look at some reference and see what we need to do. Now this here is um, it's curved, but it's it's curved this way, but it's flat that way. So you can just use a hard stick and just sand that and get rid of the Mr. Surfacer there. And then the same here, so we can sand that nice and flat. We can blow all this dust out of the uh, holes afterwards. And then the same on the um, on the aft end here. And then the same here. I'm sorry if you can hear some funny noises. That's my stomach. Not, I've had nothing to eat. So I need to go and do myself something to eat in a minute. There we go. So that's all sanded. Happy with that. All looking good. Now let's quickly go down the side here and see how this looks what I'm actually going to do in fact that's not really hard enough to sand yet so I'm gonna to have to leave that a little while longer and then I'm going to come back in fact I'm going to put some more in there because we can still see a bit of a seam I had some issues in this one area here with it keep wanting to sink back so uh, rather than try and hold it out and, and you know um, have it stressed I thought I'd just use uh, Mr. Surfacer to blend it. So I'm going to put some more on there and then we'll leave that for a few hours and then we'll come back and uh, and rub it down. Okay, so we've got this conning tower here now. I've sanded out that joint, so that's all nice and smooth now. Um, just quickly sand around these lumps. It's had about two or three applications. You can see I've got grey in there as well. Helps to use different colours because then you can see where you are. And like I know now that I'm sort of level with the plastic here with the grey, but there is a there was a high area of white in the middle there. So. It's good to know that you're not just sanding everything off, um, for want of a better term, really. So now what I've got is some Mr. Colour Leveling Thinners and uh, Cotton Bud. And I'm just going to rub over rub over the areas where the Mr. Surfacer is, or the uh, Mr. White Base, whatever it's called, just to soften it. Now in these areas here, I don't really want to sand it because I might remove details. So what you can do here is use the... Use the Mr. Colour Leveling Thinners to remove 
the list of surfacer without actually sanding away any detail and this gives you a nice clean joint without sanding or giving you a square edge so if you're actually um, like an aircraft wing if you're filling over a panel line you can use this and then what will happen is where you if you sand the, the mr servicer you end up with this you end up with no line but if you use the uh the mr color leveling thinners or you can use ak wheel color um thinners um tamiya thinners doesn't seem to work so well because it's not so hot um and obviously alcohol doesn't work hardly at all it does work some people recommend using cellulose thinners i strongly recommend you don't use cellulose thinners because it'll attack the plastic and certain plastics especially like airfix i believe will be attacked in milliseconds it'll, it'll just ruin it so be very careful um and like you see here i've got some mr servicer there get the focus there's mr servicer there around that rivet detail yeah if i sanded that i'd probably lose some rivet detail so there we go so that's all done and i'm going to do the same around the base around here but make sure i stay away from this joint because i don't want to rub the mr surface out of there i can uh, turn over the cotton bud i would also recommend not using cheap supermarket cotton buds i always get the um the johnson ones here because they seem to last better um the cheaper ones will just turn to a fluff ball in seconds when you start giving them abuse like this so um it's a shame now, I mean, it's good for the environment, it's a great thing, but it's a shame for us that the uh, stems are all made of, pla of paper now rather than plastic because they go all sloppy quite quickly if you get them too wet. So there we go. And you can see there we've got, now in there you can see we've got our Mr. Servicer in the joint. I'm talking about in here. And we've got the Mr. Servicer in the joint, but it's not, we haven't sanded anything. All we've done is gone in there with it, filled the gap and removed any excess. I mean, there was hardly any gap there to start with, but this is just to sort of, just in case. And there we go. And that's that done. That simple. Now, these areas on the end here, where we've got the, the separate parts, we may have to... Um, just sand that to blend it out. We'll see what it looks like when it's got a coat of paint on it. So now I'm going to give it a coat of the, um, I'm going to give it a coat of primer. The other thing I want to do is where I've been sanding here, I've lost some of that detail. So I'm going to go back in, some of the casting detail, sorry. So I'm going to go back in with my liquid cement. I'm going to make sure I stay away from that Mr. Surfacer. I'm just going to wet that area. just re-establish the cast detail on there there we go that's that done so we'll see how that looks now under a coat of primer so I'm gonna go for there and as I've said I can't remember if it was part five I said I, I really love it if anyone has any details about these d-shaped holes with the one mil hole in them I'd be interested to know what's actually going on there before I get this thing fitted and another shock that's going to come your way is I've decided I'm going to close this hatch um, one is because there's no detail on the inside of the hatch and it would appear from the um, looking again at the uh, RC subs PE set there should be some detail there's like a ring of bolts and a hatch um, if the PE set is correct, of course, um, and I'm sure it is. So I'm going to have the hatch closed for that reason. The other reason is the detail in here is very sparse. And when you look down in there, you're not really seeing very much. It's a shame they didn't carry the detail on down on the next level down. 
Um, but you have you have got the ladder to look at. But the main thing is the main reason I want to close it up is because if you have this open, okay, and there is a light source above it, you're going to see light shining through these holes here, because all this is just open. So that obviously wouldn't have been part. This is a part of a flooding area that wouldn't have been part of the conning tower. This is just a fairing. So I'm kind of thinking well if I if I leave that in fact there probably would be a line there wouldn't if this is an add-on fairing um if I leave that leave leave the hatch open and we got light shining through you're going to see light shining through there it's going to look awful so I could block it off but there's so many reasons to not have it open um against having it open so I'm just going to close it after all that work <laughs> never mind it's um it's part of the video isn't it? it's part of the fun part of the fun of making the model um so yeah I'm going to close the hatch so that there we are and actually, like I say, thinking about it, I'm thinking this is probably a, a, a separate added on panel. There probably would have been a line there. So I may actually swear a line there. We'll see. We'll see what, let's see what references I can find. Just one more thing quickly, guys, before we get this painted. These holes along here, the smaller holes along the bottom, they were kind of flashed over on mine. Um, and I had sanding dust in there. So I've gone through, I've just drilled them all out to 0.5 millimetres. Um, and yeah, like I say, some of them actually cut properly and some of the drill just fell through. So you could go 0.55 or 0.6 even. But um, yeah, it makes them all the same size, so it looks a lot neater. Um, they've done a lovely job of moulding them all um, and thinning out the plastic on the back, which is a nice touch. But uh, yeah, a little bit flashed over, probably just because of their tiny size. So um, that's a little something worth remembering. And there we go. That's the, uh, that's the conning tower all done now. As you can see, I've got a nice smooth outline there, but I'm not sure if there's supposed to be something there or not. I don't know. Um, there are, you know, some inaccuracies here, I'm sure, with this, with these D-shaped slots and stuff. So I don't think we're going to worry about total 100% accuracy. But you can see now, if I hold this close up, if I can get it in the light, you should be able to see that cast texture in the paint. It's very faint. I mean, you'd see it if I put a wash on it. Um, but yeah, overall... Uh, very nice. I think I need to do some more work on the ends, don't I? Not sure they're very nice. So um, there we go. So that's that. That's just um, XF19. And I've also done the, where is it? Here it is. I've also done the the inlet and exhaust now. Now I think if you're building your model as a sort of museum piece, as a lot of people do with their ships, boats, whatever, just, you know, no weathering, just fresh, brand new at the factory, I think you'll get away with that because I'm sure that would have all been painted and... With the exhaust being here i've got a feeling the paint burnt off the exhaust um due to the heat and the salt water and everything so i've got a feeling the paint would have burnt off of there and you get rust and black and iron and all sorts of different colors and we're gonna have a go at representing that on this one um so yeah i've glued the hatch back on as you can see uh so now we won't be bothering with any more detail inside there and but you know I, i've done it now and i've showed you the work let's just have a look at this see how this wooden decking looks uh, see how that looks on there and if you're wondering I actually drilled a hole in it I went through this hole on an angle that way okay so that way uh, so that it came out the side of that pin and that enabled me to put it on a cocktail stick it's always worth looking at your models and looking at different ways you can hold them and, and stuff like that um, but there we can see that wooden deck on there and it's quite nice so uh, there we are, that's on there, and then we're going to get the railings going around there. So, all in all, coming together very nicely. Um, quick Q&A. Right, so, um, comments. Um, one of my followers, Alan, um, sent me an email saying his comments were disappearing. He was worried that he was upsetting me or annoying me, and I was taking his comments off. I haven't removed anyone's comments other than the porn things. I haven't removed anyone's comments for a couple of weeks. So don't think I'm removing your comments if they're disappearing. It is nothing to do with me. It would appear that from, from following on from the words I spoke, it would appear that YouTube's having a bit of a funny at the moment and a lot of comments are disappearing. For example, um, somebody commented about, you know, why am I calling it fuselage hull? Um, this is what I believe to be blah, 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 blah. And I read it and I remember reading it and I think I replied or I at least liked it or whatever. Um, and it's gone. So I haven't, I haven't deleted it. There's nothing offensive. There was no links to any websites or anything. I see no reason for it to be gone. 
you know, if it if it contained the word coronavirus, um, if it had a link to another website, if it looked dodgy. I mean, I get emails, uh, mess emails, messages. I get comments all the time going into my folder, which is called held for review. As a creator, when you look at the comments, you can I can look at the comments from every video and uh, on one page and there is a com column there called held for review so if somebody if one of you sent me a message and it contains some obscene language it would probably go in there if you said um, if you just sent a message and said hey Nigel loving the u-boat have you seen this and you sent me a link to a website um, it would probably go in there because the algorithms would see that as being fishy so yeah, I, I don't really know what's going on. There are perfectly good, normal, friendly, kind comments that are being deleted. So I don't know. Um, anyway, so comments from and questions. This is from uh, from part four. Uh, Byro Dude, I don't know your name, sorry, you call yourself Byro Dude, asked the question about being in his workshop in the winter and the summer and everything. And I think it's some, this is something that will apply to a lot of people. And I'm sure a lot of people will have their own views on it. Um, my views are this, I have replied to his comment, solvent based products I don't think are affected by the cold and I'm basically going on the paints and stuff that I've got in the garage. Now my garage could be up to, I don't know, 10 degrees hotter than the ambient temperature in the summer and you know whatever the temperature is in the winter. So we've just had like minus five I think, minus seven maybe. Um, so I've got stuff in there which has been down to like minus seven or probably minus five because it'll probably stay a bit warmer. Um, and then, you know, in the summer with, the, with the, the sun on the roof all day and the doors all locked up and everything, I think it could get quite hot in there. Um, so, you know, it could be 30 degrees in the summer. So my solvent products don't seem to get damaged at all. I did have a, a cupboard there with house paint in it and it ruined it all. It all went to sort of all gloopy. So it all became quite lumpy. So my feeling is that water-based products are affected by cold weather. Okay, solvents don't seem to be. The only thing that does seem to get affected is resin. It tends to go thick, but I think resin does that anyway. Resin has a shelf life. So, um, so that's the answer to that one. So his question was basically, you know, I've got a metal shed. What should I do? My advice to you, mate, is any acrylic-based products, like water-based products, like your Viejos, your AKs, um, your Revels, um, I would bring them indoors, okay, keep them indoors so they're at a constant sort of temperature, but your solvent-based products I think will be fine. I think your Mr. Surfacers and stuff will probably go thick in the heat, um, and you will also find when it's hot, it's amazing with Mr. Surfacer, if you've got a hot day, if you have got some Mr. Surfacer, try this, take the lid off, put the brush in, use it, by the time you go back, it's formed a skin, it dries that fast, so... Yeah, and if it is too thick, just thin it down with some of this uh, Mr. Color Leveling Thinners and you'll be fine. Um, Spooky Tooth and Gary, um, they've both commented in part four, as have many others in other parts, about the photo etch set that's available from RC Subs and also about thinning of the bow. Um, that's going to get, I'm, I'm not going to be getting the photo etch set from RC Subs. Um, I'm not 100% sure this model needs it, but... You know, it is nice to add some fine detail, but this model's got some fine detail on it already. Um, I'm not sure about corrections on it. I, I just don't know. I don't know if, enough about the subject, but um, I'm not going to be getting it. It is very reasonably priced. It's only about 30 quid, I think. So it's very reasonably priced. Um, 20 quid even. Um, and as for thinning of the bow, that's coming next. Australian Opal. Um, prices, yeah. Model kits are becoming very expensive and I don't really think it's justified. Um, if someone like Airfix can bang out that Hellcat, the 24 scale Hellcat, which has got a multitude of sprues and, and hundreds of parts, if they can bang that out for sort of what it was when it started, it was about £100, wouldn't it? Then I don't see why this kit, for instance, should be £100. Um... You know, the, the, I think they also have to look at their, they have to forecast on volume. Now, if, you, if, you, if you're into your plastic kits, you'll probably know that ship models tend to be, not ship models, ship models tend to be very expensive. And I think that's because there's a lot of parts, which means a lot of mold tools. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into them. The more parts you've got, the more, you know, processing work you've got, the more mold tools you've got, everything 
you know, each part is an expense. So the more parts you've got, the more expense. And also, I don't think they sell as many. So, for example, if Tamiya tomorrow brought out a 30 second scale um, F4 Wildcat. Yeah, please, please, Tamiya. It would sell hundreds of thousands, I should imagine, in no time at all. If they bought out a 1350th scale Yorktown that was extremely accurate, um, it would sell a lot, but it would probably be something like 10% of the Wildcat. Now, obviously, you, you know this as a manufacturer going forward. So kits like this, a kit of a submarine is not going to sell. They, Dasbrook probably won't sell half the number of submarines as they do of their truck. OK, so they have to look at the market and judge accordingly. They spend lots and lots of money. It's, it could be hundreds of thousands. It's, it's definitely going to be tens of, tens of thousands on developing these kits and they need to get that money back. So that's why the prices go up. The other thing to remember is I don't know how old you are, Australian Opal, but if you go back to the 50s and 60s and, and 70s for some extent, model kits were toys. Model kits weren't bought by men. You didn't have grown men going to the shop on a Saturday and buying a, an Airfix Series 1 kit in a bag. It was for kids. So the models were simple. There were not many parts and their production costs would have been simple, uh, would have been low. So it was a toy. So it had to be priced at, at a toy market, at a child's market. Model kits are no longer toys. You obviously get your snap fits and all that. They are, they are toys. But model kits like this, they're made for men and collectors. And because they know that men and collectors will pay the price, they can charge it. You know, they could probably knock this kit out, this, this submarine, for 20 quid. And, you know, they probably would sell... 30% more than they will at £100. So that's just, this is all my opinion. Um, so please don't get on your tippy tappy and tell me that I'm wrong and I don't know what I'm talking about. This is just my opinion and, and that's it. So that's why I think model kits are so expensive. People talk about rising oil prices. I mean, if you think about it, you know, five litres of oil in this country has probably doubled in the last 10 years. How many litres of oil are there making this kit? You know, um, it's not oil prices that are putting kit prices up, I can assure you. It may be a small percentage, but it's not all of it. Um, and as you say, the CAD research and everything that goes into them and the CAD work, well, you know my feelings on that. I think it's because of CAD and everything that there's so many issues with kits these days, you know, lofting lines and stuff like that. You didn't get it years ago. And if anybody wants to argue that, then I will throw it straight in your face. I will throw the 1968 monogram b52 which is still available today okay now compare that the shape of that model its dimensions its features and its shape and its outward look everything okay there is no other b52 kit on the market in any scale and i'm including the hph in any scale that is more accurate shape wise than that model okay it's awesome now look at the model collect kit compared to it. Nah. I mean, I could do a list. I could probably just talk through errors in that model collect kit for 10 minutes. Okay, as you know, I know it very well. And yes, they're small errors and they're rivet counting errors, but they are nonetheless errors. And I think the old days of people sitting down and, and making a model, or a, this is the thing for me, okay? I know I'm waffling, I'm, I'm gonna get off the subject now. Um, in the old days, the people who designed these model kits were artists, they were sculptors, they were enthusiasts, whatever. They made these models to the shape that they saw in a photograph and they wanted it to accurately represent that shape. All right. These days, you've got youngsters who sit on a CAD machine. And it seems to me these days in engineering that if you can use CAD, you're automatically a designer. That's not how it used to be. Um, and these people, they sit there and they design these kits. They've probably never even seen the subject and they don't have a clue, which is why you get models with completely wrong engines, models with completely wrong shaped noses, models with all sorts of crazy errors. I mean, there's even, you know, there's even, I'm not going to mention kits, but there are kits out there with the incorrect number of wheels on the undercarriage. For Christ's sake, you know, it's just ridiculous. 
and um, you'll find all of these kits with all these errors are all old, uh, are new, sorry. The old kits don't have those errors. You know, all of the 148 scale monogram bombers, you've got the, the, the A20, the B26, the B24, the B17, the B29, the B25, all of those kits. Yep, they've got raised paddle lines. Yep, they've got some heavy detail on the riveting and stuff. But they've got full interior detail and the overall shape is spot on. So, yeah, I, I really, it does annoy me. Modern kits... And CAD CAM and everything, it really does annoy me. And they shouldn't be the prices they are, it's a joke. Right, so, uh, moving on. Uh, Pat sent a comment. I talked about this thing here. Which goes in here and it fits like a prick in a top hat. So it's going to be difficult to make it stay up. I've made a hole in there and I'm going to expand the hole. Extend the pin. If this was just going into a round hole, I would actually squash it with a pair of pliers and make it oval, which would just give it enough friction to make it stay in place. What Pat suggested was cover it in super glue and tighten it up. Yes, in a hole, I think that would work, but in this slot, I mean, eventually when it goes together, it will be a hole because you've got a piece in the deck that goes in there. But um, yeah, I, I don't think that would work in this situation, but I could give it a go, whatever. I, I don't know. I, I, I'll use it on another project. So uh, thanks for that, Pat. It's a bloody and good finally, idea. Let's move on. And we're going to have a look at the bow. This is actually pre-recorded. So I'm saying this after the event because I wanted to see how it came out. But um, it's looking quite good. So I'm going to do this, run this bit of video, and at the end of it then, that'll be the end of part six. Okay, so here we go. This bow. Let's have a look at how we're going to do this. This is the way I'm going to do it. I'm not suggesting this is the way you should do it. And as you can see, I haven't even started. So I don't even know at this time, at this moment, it's going to work. What I do know is if I do mess up and I lose the, the rivet detail, I have got some Archer rivets to go on there to um, replace them. So I'm happy with that. I've got single rows and I've got the double rows as well. Like you can see you've got here, you've got the double the double staggered roll on the um, row on there as well so I'm not really too worried if I lose the detail I can replace it but I'm going to try and do this without losing that detail so that maybe you can do it as well so first thing we need a hard sander now you know I've got these little infini sanders this is the five millimeter and these are basically just photo etched stainless steel which is very hard and it gives you a nice controllable flat sander so you don't start rounding things off and for these, you can get the self-adhesive um, premium ultra precision sanding sheet of sticker type. And these come in 400 up to 7000 grit and they're waterproof. You can use them wet. They're very, very good quality and they last a very, very long time. I've had these. I mean, have a look back when I did a review. I've probably had them six or seven months, maybe even nine months. And this is the first time I've changed the material. What I have discovered is the to get it off, you just peel them off with a knife and then the, the residual glue is removed with IPA. So that's really easy. And then you get the self-adhesive one. It's just cut it into the strip, whatever you want, whatever size you want. I've cut this one into a five mil wide strip. So just get rid of the excess there. And then it's literally a case of coming along and just sticking that on like so. Get the end lined up. And there you go down that and that is one length look is half half the width if you do get these start cutting from this end not this end otherwise you lose your number and you look you don't know what it is so start cutting from that end that's the uh, the one tip i can give you so um and if you really want a hard edge so that you can uh, go into corners and stuff i'm not sure if this blade's going to do it. i think it's probably seen better days but you can actually trim the side so you get a very very sharp corner and then you can go into sharp corners so the first thing I want to do is remove this um, towing loop on the front I'm assuming it's a towing loop uh, so I've got my JLC saw here um, and these are I think the best saw on the market that I've come across so I'm going to cut this off rather than try and sand it so I'm just going to slice this off. It'd be an easy case of gluing it back on. So, right, I need to put that somewhere safe. So I'm going to get some masking tape. Put that on there like that. And then I can tape that to the side of my drawers over here. Not my pants, my drawers. Um, and that way, I know, it, I know, well, I'll probably forget, but I don't, I'm throwing it away then. So, 
I'm now going to take a magic marker, which is something I always tell everyone not to do, but because this is going to be dark grey and it's going to be weathered and everything, it doesn't really matter. The reason I say not to do this, if you don't get it all off, when you put your primer coat down, it'll pop through. When you put your, your paint coat down, it'll pop through. You'll never get rid of it, it'll keep popping through. So, But I just want to colour all this in here. Okay, and basically just mark it all out with ink so that I can see where I'm sanding because I want to try and avoid sanding off those rivets as I said just now. Now on the bottom here we've got this plate now there's rivets in there you may decide just to sand that flat and lose them but we're, we're probably going to lose some rivets let's let's face it it's, it, it's um there's probably no way we're going to get around it. So the first thing we can do is start scraping so if we start on the top as I said, remember, I'm just going to repeat myself here, as I've already said twice in part five. This is what we're doing. If you look at this bow, it's supposed to come to a, a sort of point, but you can see that it doesn't. It's moulded and then it comes out square. So what we're going to do is, is carry on this angle, and that should give us a slimmer front end. So what I'm going to do first of all is scrape. And I'm keeping my blade behind those rivets. Now, I may be able to achieve this without sanding, just by scraping. And we should be able to see now when we look at the top. Now I'm just running the knife off into my finger there. It's not going to cut me because the knife is away from my finger. But the reason I'm doing that is it stops it just... If you do this, it just falls off the end. But if you have your finger there... It kind of catches it and it stops you rounding off. I know what I mean. You try it and you'll see what I mean. But hopefully, I mean, if I sand away this, if I get rid of this Mr. Surfacer on the top of here, so we're down to the grey plastic, we should see a lot better. Right. So, that ink smells lovely from that pen. We can see there that we've still got the square, we've still got the square lump there but I've just taken the front edge of it off. So it looks like those rivets start behind where the square lump starts. So I'm just gonna keep going, I'm gonna... It's kind of looking like we're gonna have to lose those rivets, guys. But I still stand by my what I say. I don't think you can do this by just sanding the inside. Come at a ridiculous angle and see what happens. See there, I've put the angle on. Come on, focus. Now we've got an angle on there now instead of that square lump. I don't think it's going to be enough to thin it out because the I think the square section starts behind those rivets. I'm just wondering if I can scrape away and leave a step and see how that looks. Yeah, I don't think we're going to get here, guys. Hmm, I'm going to have to lose those rivets, it's looking like. Because it looks like, if you look on this side, we can see where the rivets are. And then when we turn it over, we can see it starts the flat in amongst those rivets so I mean we could just slim it out a bit like this I don't want to touch the other side because I want it for a reference for the riveting should I have to replace them but then I guess I've got this video as a reference haven't I? I could do a snapshot do a snapshot of that do a snapshot of that there we go and then we can see what the rivets look like We shall see. 
So let me have a little play with this and then I'll, uh, I'll come back and show you where I've got to. Okay, so I've done this top little bit now and I have had to lose that double row of rivets. The vertical ones down there, but I haven't actually touched the rivets that go around that hole. So the way I've done that, what I've done, I've put some black marker over there because I want to make sure it's flat. So if I take a flat blade and just stroke it across, you can see where it where the blade is touching and not. So you just keep going until you get all nice and flat. I mean, we can always brush some Mr. Surfacer on there anyway. And then I'm going to come in with this fresh sanding stick and just sand the top of that nice and uh, straight. And that way we get a nice angle on there. So now you can see, if we look un under now, under the through the camera we can see now that we've got the the angle now is just continuing in one come on focus you can see the angle is continuing in one angle rather than this square lump sticking out so I need to do that now all the way down here and unfortunately like I say I need to lose that first double row of rivets so I have to be careful around the torpedo tubes not to touch those rivets there so um I'll carry on now and scrape down below I think the thing to do is, is to save you having to do major repair work if you come in with a the fine side of your saw and just make a in fact you could use a knife if you don't have a saw and just make a clean the blade off make a line in the plastic like so and then if you scrape to that line And don't scrape just cut down to it like this and don't scrape beyond it you'll end up making that straight carry forward and you won't have any repair work to do so and by having this pen on there we can make sure that we keep the line parallel I think I need to put a fresh blade in here actually to be honest it's uh, We just keep scraping like that and just removing material to make what we're going to end up with is a line which is we want it to be parallel with the center line going down here okay so just by doing what i've already showed you it's just scraping and working to the you know cutting a line in these strakes which will make the the blade stop um, we can actually retain the retain that detail there so that's okay um, it's funny because when you look at the standard kit, the, the actual streaks just sort of carry on, but they just feather into this great square lump. So it's a bit weird. Um, obviously careful around the rivets on the, uh, on the um, torpedo tube, but if you do lose any, they can always be replaced. And what I've done is, if, if I can get it in the light, you can see I've sanded the front off. And you can see the seam line running down the centre roughly with the black in it. And um, you can see now that this side is much thinner than the other. So what we're going to end up with is it is not a pointed front as such. I'm going to radius it off because it probably would have been like a capped piece of either a capped piece of sheet rolled around or it would have been a cast uh, block there. I believe in the early days, like certainly with ships, they were big into building, you know, ramming things. So maybe this had the capability to ram something I don't know but we can see from the top we've now got that angle coming straight down instead of having that square lump and you can see when we look at the front and this is all by scraping so uh, I think even if you even if you do sand it from the inside you're still going to have this square this square lump on the side and I don't think that's correct so I don't know I haven't done anything with the bottom yet, I haven't decided what to do. I may cut it off, cut it about in half, sand the inside of it and make it into a taper because that rivet detail will be extremely difficult to replace. So we'll, we'll see. Um, probably easier to replace the rivet detail than it would be to um, thin it out or cut it, what I just said. Or, um, you know, just, just leave it unriveted perhaps, I don't know. But uh, let me get the other side done and see how we get on. All right, so I've done this side, as you can see, and I've done some of this side, and I've worked out a way that I can show you, sort of, 
tell you how I do it and if you want to follow me then you can. Um, we can see here on the stem that the you can see the mould line, the, the, the seam line where it's glued together because what I've done is put some pen over it and then just one wipe with a sanding stick and that just leaves that pen line in the in the, the sort of seam line that's there. Don't sand it too much because you'll sand the line out and then you'll lose your centre point. And you have to bear in mind as well, it doesn't matter if it's not perfectly centred around that line because once that seam line is filled, no one's ever going to know where the perfect centre line is anyway. As long as it's right at the top, it doesn't really matter. So what I've decided, this is the way I'm doing it, is I'm going across, okay, with my knife, as I showed you before, and pick up on the edge of that straight and then just cut down and slice a line. Okay, and that gives you something to cut to then. Okay, then I'm going to come with the knife and at a much too steep an angle, I'm just going to cut. You can, you, you can hear the knife hit that where it hits the... Hear that? You can hear that as it goes in, it kind of hits that line. And then just scrape away in between those two lines at way too steep an angle until you get the front edge about even. Okay, so when you when you look at it here, what you want to see is even though you've got way too steep an angle, you want to see here that it's even. So you've got an equal amount either side of the line and there's not really much of a line showing there. At least the camera's not picking it up. So, in fact, it would be better to show you on this upper one where the line, this upper one here, where the line is there. So, let me do that again. So, under here, hit nice and tight, just cut a line in. And then the same here on the side of this straight, cut a line in. And all I'm doing is giving myself something to cut to. You can hear there the knife hitting the hitting the stop as it comes to that cut. Okay, careful not to cut your strake off. If you can do this without having to add any plastic, give yourself a medal. So now I'm going to do is scrape away at much too steep an angle. So I'm putting like a 45 degree chamfer on the front. But what I'm looking at is getting the very front edge on the stem even. Okay, so I want an even amount of plastic either side of that black line there. Okay, so I'm pretty much there. I need to take a tiny little bit more off. So I'm just going to scrape it gently just to sort of square it up and everything. And then go into the corners, make sure they're all clear. And then come along with the pen. All right, mark the there you've just scraped with a pen and then come in at an angle and start scraping away at the rivet area until you blend just behind those rivets just keep going and what I'm looking at is blending out this side where that square lump ends until I just start to touch this front edge and I remove all the pen Just like that. And then once that front edge disappears and the back edge disappears, then I know I've actually achieved what I set out to achieve. So then I can come in with the sanding stick, sand up the edges like so. I want to go across the front, I can. And then if I want to just check everything's nice and flat and even, I can colour that in with pen again. Come along with the pen and just lightly go over it until you can see I've got a high spot in the middle because what I want it to be is flat. Like I said, it doesn't need to be perfect because we're going to put rivets over it anyway. Again, scrape the ends, clean up the corners, and then when we look at the front, the stem. We should be able to see 
that were pretty much even around that centre line. If anything, I could have taken a little bit less off. I just give it one wipe. There we go. You can see here, that's what I've just done. So we're even about that centre line. Now we've got a sort of a bit of a pointed bow, which I think is probably a lot more realistic than it would have been. And if we radius these corners off here, I think that's how it's going to uh, actually would have been rather than a dead sharp point. So I'm going to go on and get this finished now. There we go. I'm going to call that pretty much done. Um, we could, we've now got a nice sort of thin stem. It's not um, pointed, which I don't think it would have been, but it's uh, it's fairly pointed. So once, I'm, once I've got a cut of primer on and I'm happy that everything's nice and square and even and everything, then I'm going to um, sort of put a radius in here and I'm also going to decide what I'm going to do with the end of these stripes because obviously we can't have them finish off with a great lump like that and also need to decide what I'm going to do with this chin. Also looking down here, they've extended this flat area to the, to the bottom so that's going to need sanding as well. Sorry, you can't really see that in light, but they, you can see we've got a flat on there. So that's going to need sanding out when we do the seam. But the rivets are weak down there anyway. I don't know why, but the rivets are weak in there. The, the rivets are weaker there than they are around here. And if it wasn't slide moulded, then I don't know quite know how that's happened. But um, anyway, there we are. So uh, yeah, happy with that. <coughs> and um, now we've got it thinned out. So everybody should be happy including me <laughs> right let's move on okay so there we go the bow is um pretty much done i've done no more on it since i did the last bit of filming this is now talking to you directly after we did the q a bit so um yeah i've just had a run um i haven't done the bottom yet i'm not sure what to do i'm tempted to just sand all that riveting off of this part and then just blend it around because obviously we haven't got this we, we shouldn't have this great big blunt section on here this should be tapered in on the bottom the same so um i'm tempted to just sand that riveting off and then maybe try and replace it or just leave it unriveted uh it's a shame that they didn't do like trumpeter would do even though they raised rivets in real life trumpeter would give you divots <laughs> um but uh yeah it's a shame they didn't do that because then you could just sand away to your heart content and re-rivet it but i have got some uh rivets in fact i'll show them now. i've got these micro get the paper out so it's not all glossy i've got these micromark rivets and um they're basically made in america they're for rail railroads and you can see here we've got the double rows there and you just put them on as you do with decals and you set them down with certain solutions so um that's what i'm going to be using on here and this is the this is the sheet you get and as you can see, if I show you close up, you get just single rows of rivets like this. And they are actually, if you can hear, they're actually raised rivets. OK. Um, and then we've got the staggered lines that we've got here. OK, you've got these staggered lines here, which is what I'll use on the bow to replace the rivets I've taken off. And then you've got the, the radial rivets and everything here. So I could actually... Because what I'm tempted to do, when I feel this, it feels like it kind of, it feels like it sort of comes along and then goes in. Whereas it should, I think, just go in in one angle. So I'm tempted to kind of blend it out, but I don't think it will notice under um, under matte grey paint. But um, there we go. So uh, that's what they are. They're, micro they're not cheap. They are bloody expensive. Um, I bought these from America many years ago. I bought a load of them. And um, they were like... $25 by the time I got them here to the UK like $25 a sheet so or, or a set there's two sheets in a set so yeah they're not cheap but I bought loads of them because I thought well you know I'm not going to pay the postage and the import duty all those not many times and I haven't really used many of them so that's what I'm going to be using on there you can see they're so expensive you keep the little off cuts <laughs> um, but they are very good and they look amazing under a coat of paint in fact, there's the invoice there. I don't want to show you the address details. There we go. $254, $28.93, freight, $283. And then when it gets here, you get charged the customs. So, yeah, great. They probably worked out about $300. So, um, there we are. Um, so, that's the bow done. And we'll move on from there. You'll also notice here I've got a piece of plastic strip attached to the deck. The deck is not fixed to the hull yet, 
one thing you will have to do, whoops, whack in the nose there. This area at the back is extremely tight. You can see it doesn't really want to come out. It will come out. This area back here, you've got these two holes and then you've got these two lugs that go in. The, the lugs are too big, so I need to, need to do some more sanding and get, get these reduced down um, in size. But basically, I'm fitting in there. My next operation now is going to be to get some glue on all those supports and bulkheads inside, get the, the deck in and then tape it all together, get it all held together solid, let that glue set and then we'll be done. I'm not gluing the deck in because I found an issue so we'll cover that um, maybe in the next video. But anyway, thanks for watching guys. Uh, we will get this done in the next video and we'll have a go at some of those, um, those rivets. What I might do off camera is sand this um, and then get this coated in Mr. Surfacer because you need to have some Mr. Surfacer or something for those decals to, to stick down well. So um, thanks for watching. I'll see you all for part seven. Sorry about the rant, <clears throat> but now and again, you know, you just have to let off some steam because it just gets so, so bloody frustrating. Um, you know, you, you've got all your um, celebrities out there and everything that have to put up with it all the time, but they get paid a lot of money for doing what they do. This is... Um, becoming a pretty thankless task to be honest but um anyway see you all soon look out for part seven bye for now